So let me uh, start talking about uh, stochastic processes and in particular the uh, stationary stochastic processes. So unlike the random variable, we have uh, things are evolving with respect to time and so there is uh, a realization. Except, uh, so generally what happens is any, 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 you have uh, one function of time. And if you only have this one function of time, then it's a deterministic process. In other words, you have this is the way things are evolving. Except in the case of stochastic processes, this evolution uh, could be from a collection of different realizations. So I'm going to tutorially show like this. So you have, as you can see, there are two variables. So this is like saying that at any time instant, nature is going to toss a dice of some uh, random variable and depending on its realization, uh, uh, depending on what the value is, you are going to get a, a realization. So this collection of waveforms is the stochastic process. So another way to interpret is that if you look at a noise process, somebody measures, you may get to one waveform in the same room or like uh, it's exactly the same noise. So another person makes a measurement either some other time or somewhere else, you will get a different uh, realization except. So the collection of all, so in other words, if you say that uh, in, in any equipment or etc., noise is you, you know that you, when you make it a, sec a second measurement for a while, if it is going to be different from the first measurement for due to various reasons, maybe the electrons and temperature, lots of uh, parameters go into it. So the best way to describe is that, first of all, it's a function of time, but it also has another way, unlike a deterministic process, it also has, it's a function of uh, a random outcome. So the collection of all this is the stochastic process. Another way to characterize is that if you freeze time, then you see a random variable. So what you see here is x of t at t equal to t naught, let's say, or t equal to t1. And I can call this to be a random variable x1. Similarly, if I take another time instant t2, this is the x at t2. So I can call this to be the random variable x2, etc. At the time tn, I have x of tn, and that's the random variable x. So another way to characterize this is that if you take arbitrary time instants t1, t2, etc. at tn, you get the random variables. Uh, x1, x2, etc, etc. So then now we know that if you have a set of random variables and if this is from a phenomenon which is, which has, of course this random variable <coughs> as you can realize because it is coming from the parent phenomenon is possibly will have some connection with this random variable. In other words, there may be correlation or dependence. In the extreme case, it could be independent also. So these are all possibilities. And if you have n random variables, uh, then you could uh, think of their joint density function. So if you have n random variables x1, x2, x3, etc., etc., one way to characterize them would be uh, to look at their joint density function. But we know that, of course, if I change this t1 to somewhere else. I'm going to get a completely different random variable. So this random variable corresponds to this time instant t1. And the second one, uh, the time instant matters because if you change the time, you're going to get a different random variable and uh, possibly different behavior, etc. tn. So this, usually remember, a random variable is going to be a function of the variable itself. It has got its own density function. Here, 
You have the same random variable. Of course, it's a, it's a characterization is uh, by, by this time instead. If you change the time, you are going to get a different characterization. So this density function itself could be different. So one way, so the logical way to characterize such a process is to find out the joint density function for uh, all values of time. But look at the job involved. You can, of course, you can take arbitrary t1 to tn. Then you can find the joint density function. But then, what should be the value of n? You can say all values of n. So, of course, that's a. And if you know the, such a joint density function, then you know that uh, that's the complete characterization of the stochastic process. And uh, the joint density function is good because from that you can find the marginal density functions, etc. If you know the joint density function of x and y, you integrate out y, you get the joint density function of x. If you integrate out x and you get the joint density function of x1 to x and minus 1, etc. So the simplest characterization of this is using the first order of density function. Just take one random variable at some time instant p. So unlike here, this is going to be a function of both the, the variable x which, is, which actually represents, if it is a noise, it represents the voltage, etc. And it will have its own density function, but that density function could be changing from time to time. <laughs> so this is called the first order characterization. with one random variable, right? just x of t1 or x1. Now we could deal with the two random variables from here, uh, x1 and x2. So that will give us uh, the second order characterization, x1 and x2, x1 corresponding to time instant t1 and x2 corresponding to time instant t2. So this is the second order characterization. Of course, you can go to third order, fourth order. In general, this is the nth order characterization. The joint density function tells you everything about the random variables, right? There's nothing more to be so the joint similarly if you are just considering one time instant at a time, the complete information is contained in its uh, uh, density function, except the density function could be a function of time. If you have so this is uh, the characterization through the density functions. If you have the density function, you can also uh, find out its mean and variance. Right? So the mean would be expected value of that random variable which corresponds to x of t. So that's going to be x multiplied by its density function. So you can see, look at here, x will integrate out. So in general, this could be a function of for a time. So, so we call this to be the mean of the stochastic process. So the thing to notice is that the mean could be a function of a time. Okay, random variable mean is always a constant. So this is no longer a random quantity, it's just a deterministic quantity except it's a function of time. Similarly here, if you have two random variables, you can look at its uh, auto, uh, its uh, correlation function, right? Two random variables, you can look at its uh, xt1, xt2, or in general we have look at it xt1, xt2 star, because if the process is complex, if it is real, it's just a... So this is like saying expected value of x, y. That's a, that's a, that gives us an idea about correlation. If the, if, the, if the random variables are zero, I mean this is the same as the covariance, right? Call this x, call this y, two random variables, so the product, expected value of the product. But this is the same as, look here, x1, x2, the joint density function from the x1, x2, uh, t1, t2. 
So again, x1, x2 goes away by integration and you are going to get this to be a function of t1 and t2. Because it is, because we are dealing with the same process. Look, this is from time instant t1, this is from time instant t2. The same process, we call this function to be an autocorrelation function. So generally this notation is reserved. The capital R is used and this xx means you are dealing with the same process. Uh, this is uh, the value at the pro random process at time instant t1. This is multiplied by the value of the same random process, not another process y of t. So because it is the same, we call it auto, a u t u. So this is the autocorrelation function. So you know that this is actually the correlation that we have studied, or co correlation or covariance. From here, of course, if you subtract the uh, double means, product of the means, you get the auto covariance function. So the important thing to remember is, in the previous case, this was not a function of time. Here, it's a function of two time variables, t1 and t2. And as I said, uh, if you want the uh, covariance, so r t1 comma t2 minus mu t1 mu t2. Remember, expected value of xy minus mu x mu y. That was the covariance. Right? So if you want me, you can call this to be cxx t1 comma t2. So this is <coughs> auto covariance function. So you can see everything is these concept concepts are developed from the two random variables, random variables exactly. So you have the you can either deal with the density functions or you can deal with the mean function and the autocorrelation function. So what we notice is that in general, for any stochastic process, uh, the, uh, the, the mean mean could be a function of time and the autocorrelation could be a function of t1 and t2. Uh, so look at here. If I, especially if you put a t2 equal to t1, uh, what is this quantity? Anybody? If x of t is a voltage, uh, if I put t2 equal to t1 equal to t, then this becomes the absolute value square. What do you call this quantity? Anybody? Mean square voltage. Mean square value, what do you call that? RMS right here. Uh, R stands for root mean square. If you take a root, this will become RMS. But you can see, this is the voltage, it is the average value of the power. So we could call this to be P. And that is just Rxx with t comma t. So of course you notice that for a stochastic process in general, the power could be fluctuating from time instant to time instant in general. So this power could be in the function of t. You take the square root of that, you get the R plus value. depends on time. If you change time, you get something else. That's what this says here. So now the question is, if there is any stationary behavior, how do you capture it? Stationary behavior of stochastic processes. So the best way to uh, try to address this problem is to come back to this diagram. Any questions? What? Remember, look at what 
it just uh, only what is happening over the instant not nothing is integrated over time right so as you can see especially consider something like this it thinks uh, the way a stochastic process is goes on goes on forever right energy is the power consumed right so if things go on forever and if, they, if some, some finite power is consumed the energy is going to be uh, unbounded right so it becomes meaningless to speak about energy for an open stochastic process what makes sense is what happens yeah the power level so that's the power you can integrate that over a time and uh, and uh, average it that will give you the energy but if you keep integrating there is no it's going to be unbounded in general right? especially if you say this is an ongoing process right? like ocean right the waves are coming in so if you start integrating the energy So to see whether there is any underlying stationary behavior, one way to do is to follow it. Look at the behavior of these n random variables, that you want here. <laughs> so you have these n random variables corresponding to arbitrary time instance t1, t2, etc., tn. Then it's like saying that <laughs> let me come back tomorrow and look at the same uh, same n random variable. So I'm going to shift everything by some constant amount of c. I'm, so this time will be t1 plus c. <laughs> and so I shift everything and generate new random variable. So I'm going to generate x2 by c. So this is going to be t2 plus c. So I'm going to call this t1 prime. So I have a new random variable corresponding to x of t1 plus c and I am going to call this x1 prime. Similarly this is random variable x of t2 plus c and I am going to call it x2 prime. And similarly I shift everything and I shift this last one also by c, the same amount. And so this is tn plus c and this random variable is x of tn plus c. And this I'm going to call it x and prime. So look, you have some joint behavior here through this density function. Now I'm going to shift everything. So the idea is that if there is some stationary behavior, their joint density function should reflect. So now I'm going to look at the joint density function of x1 prime, x2 prime, etc., x and prime. So this is going to be x1, x2, etc., xn. For time instance, t1 plus c, t2 plus c, etc., tn plus c. <coughs> Let me rewrite it here. So you have random variables x1 through xn, and you have random variables x1 prime through xn prime. You know, xi means, of course, random variable corresponding to ti, and here xi prime means the random variable corresponding to ti plus. C. So we have, we have shifted everything by a constant amount. This is why I'm saying that we saw some phenomenon here, and we come back and look at the same thing again tomorrow. And if you see that the behavior is more or less the same, then we begin to say that there is some structure, right? And you come back day after tomorrow, you see the same thing. So, of course, you can see if you want to strictly consider, say that there is some stationarity, you will say that the joint density function of the original n random variables and the shifted random variables, uh, if, if it is same, then we call there is some underlying structure, strong structure, because you are dealing with the density functions. So, this is the definition of strict sense stationarity. Strict because we are dealing with the density functions. So let me uh, bring in the notion of strict sense 
Uh, so strict sense is usually used in notation SSS. Strict sense tertiary behavior. Is then the joint density function of x1 through xn. Same as uh, those at x uh, at time instance uh, shifted uh, versions of that. So this could be true or false. If this is true for all for all C. Then we say the process is strictly stationary everywhere. But you can see the demand that we are asked, uh, demand that's put on the system for that to be true. So what is a strict and stationary process? If this relation is true for any TIs, any N, any C, <coughs> you could take the to be arbitrary, you could take any number of the time instance, and you can shift them by any arbitrary amount, the joint density function must be it's true for all values. <coughs> so you say it's not true, then the process is not strict sensation. If it is true, the process is strict sensation. Now maybe demanding it on all order of n may be too much. So we can relax the definition and we can define first order of strict sensation. Is if uh, if you pick up any time instead uh, t, so you have this one, and shift that random variable by some amount uh, t plus c. If these two density functions are true, then we call the process to be first order strict sensation. In other words, we are dealing with n equal to one. Notice that I don't put I put x1 through xn here. I don't put x1 prime x2 prime xn prime because then we will not be able to compare. Remember the address clearly shows which random variable we are dealing with. These random variables and these random variables are not the same. One corresponds to time instant t1 through tn. These correspond to a shifted version. But if you want to compare the density function, you don't want, you cannot put your x and you cannot put your y, it's an, you cannot compare, right? If you want to compare an equation, you have to put the same variable here and see whether they are equal or not. Again, there is no confusion. You can see this variable corresponds to this random variable. That's not the same as this random variable. So I said that the, for example, if you say x and y have the same identical uh, density function, what does that mean? That means the density function of x is the same as the density function of y. You cannot write it like this because x equal to y, that doesn't make any sense. So if you want to compare, then you say either this or you replace. So the two random variables are identical density function. If the density function of x looks like this. And the density function of y looks like the, exactly the same way. This is in that. So if you re, if you redraw this with, and you can compare, right? If you redraw this with x here, you're still dealing with a random variable y. Then uh, you know the one diagram sits on top of the other. So that's the meaning of this and this. So, if a process is first order strict and stationary, then the first order density function at time t and any other t plus c should be the same. So, this should be true for any c. So, it must be true for c equal to minus t. That means if you put c equal to minus t, you get the first order density function to be just x. So, the conclusion is if a process is first order strict and stationary, then the first order PDF, first order density function is independent of time. You can see 
here, right? This should be true for <coughs> here. This should be true for any C. So if it is true for any C, let me put C equal to t minus T. Then you get T minus T is zero, so that's gone. So you'll get this. Let, let's also look so that one consequence. Let me put this so you, you don't need this right. So the density function is dependent on right. One consequence there is if in that case let me find out the mean mean of the process. Expected value of x of t is integral x a density function. But look at now, density function is independent of t. So you get this to be a constant. So once again, this is if the process is first order sticks in stationary, look here. If the process is first order sticks in stationary, the density function is independent of time and the mean is a constant. <laughs> That's not the case here. The mean is not a constant in general. So this is not a stationary process. This is a first order station, a friction stationary process. Now, let's see what is a second order friction stationary process. As you can imagine, what it says is this, this relation must be true for two random variables. So if I take time instance t1 and t2, x1 comma x2, t1 comma t2 must be the same as f x1 prime x2 prime x1 x2 t1 plus c t2 plus c so this should be true for any c so i am going to put c equal to let's say minus t t2 then i get this density function should be a function of x1 x2 this becomes t2 minus 2, this becomes t1 minus t2. function so autocorrelation function here is going to be so in this case the autocorrelation function is going to be in general it is t1 comma t2 but it is double integral x1 x2 the density function so i'm going to put this density function f of x1 x2 t1 minus t2 dx1 dx2 so for x1 x2 goes away, you get some function of t1 minus t2. So if a process is strict, uh, second order strict and stationary, look here, the autocorrelation is only a function of t1 minus t2, not t1 comma t2. So if you don't, if you, there is no stationarity, the mean could, could be a function of time <coughs> and the autocorrelation could be a function of T1 and T2 separately. But if there is strict some stationarity, important thing to realize is this, the, density, the first order density function is only a function of, there is no time. And the second order density function uh, depends on t1 minus t2 but a uh, two byproducts are the mean is a constant and the autocorrelation function only depends on t1 minus t2 <coughs> So sometimes what happens is it's very difficult to figure out whether the process is strict and stationary or not. In other words, how will you find out the density function? Generally, you have a set of measurements. So it may it may be very difficult to verify this and this or this. But 
If the process is switch situation, then you get two two freebies. The mean is a constant, and the autocorrelation is a function of only t1 minus t2. So we can use a we can define a or we can relax our definition for stationarity and come up with a new notion for stationarity, and that can wide the sense stationary processes. Wide sense stationary W process. So what is wide sense stationary? We don't bother with in density function. We just say that a process is wide sense stationary if the if the mean is a constant. And uh, and the autocorrelation function is only a function of t1 minus t2. So we look for these two properties. We are not going to look at the density function. We just look at these two properties. If these two properties are true, we call it a wide sense stationary processes. Just because these properties are true, this, this may not be true. So we know that, of course, if, if, if a process is fixed and stationary, you know that this is true, this is true. Consequently, you have mean and uh, these conditions are automatically satisfied. So you can see that all switches and stationary processes are wide and stationary processes. But you know that there is no reason the other way it is true. So this is not going to be wide and stationary, it doesn't imply switches and stationary unless the process is a Gaussian process. So I will explain to you what is Gaussian. So we have a theorem. We have, I defined the two ways of uh, dealing, uh, dealing with uh, two notions of stationarity, strict sense stationary behavior and wide sense stationary behavior. Bottom line is strict sense stationary behavior deals with the joint density functions. The first order density function is a constant independent of time. I mean, it is not a function of time. The second order density function only depends on t1 minus t2, the difference of time variables. Consequently, the mean is a constant, the autocorrelation is a function of t1 minus t2. That's the that's what you get from a section stationary process. Why is stationary process? We have no idea about the density function. We say if a process is white and stationary, if its mean is a constant and the autocorrelation function only depends on t1 minus t2. So we, we just work with symptoms, observables. These are easily observable, perhaps. So, so you have some structure here. This is very tight structure. This is loose, a loose thing. That's why it's called a wide system. Loose. So I introduced two notions of stationary behavior, how tight or coupled with the process is. This is very uh, tightly coupled, this is loosely coupled. If it is tightly coupled, it's always loosely coupled. But this way it is not true, unless it is Gaussian, which I have to But now let me come up with, this, I'll show you some examples of stationary and not stationary behavior. <coughs> 